G'day fans and welcome back to another exciting episode of Nerdy Things from Another World. Yes, it's that podcast where we focus on sci-fi movies, TV shows and occasionally Australian sci-fi fandom. My name is Dags and with me is not my co-host Jeffro, who is literally cruising for a bruising on a Disney themed cruise ship. But don't worry, because not only am I not alone for this episode, but my guest is actually sitting in the room with me. Yes, we've referenced him in every episode of the show we've produced, so I felt this was a great time to bring him in to speak on his own behalf. Welcome to Russell Devlin. Great to be here, Dags. So the reason why we brought you on is because you keep getting referenced in all of our previous uh, episodes, and uh, it seems like a good idea to sort of like have you on board to chat about your history. So one of the things that uh, I've always been impressed by uh, regarding yourself is actually your knowledge of sci-fi movies and TV shows. So let's go right, right, right back. And uh, how did you get into this stuff in the first place? What uh, what uh, kicked it all off for you? Well, um, I suppose I was a science fiction fan uh, back in the 60s from the TV shows. You had things like Astro Boy on, uh, Supercar, Fireball XL5, Stingray, Thunderbirds, all that type of thing. Also, in those days, you used to get a lot of the old horror films on TV. You had, if you remember how popular Famous Monsters of Filmland was as a magazine, and you used to get that type of thing on TV all the time. And, of course, me and my sister were really big fans of Deadly Earnest, and, of course, I got to interview him many, many years later for um, Con 9 from Outer Space. So is it safe to say that your interest in sci-fi primarily started with British and Japanese related shows? Uh, well, I didn't think of it in terms of being of international. This was just what was on TV. Uh, it was And of course, with, with some of the um, Anderson shows, I didn't even realise they were British at the time because of course they had all American voices on them or they were deliberately targeted towards the American market. But uh, basically I was watching anything with science fiction that came on. And of course, I was a fan of Australia's own Phoenix Five. So um, your knowledge of um, your background regarding films uh, in particular, especially the 1950s classics, because yes. you have a lot of in-depth knowledge regarding uh, the history of sci-fi filmmaking. Mm. Where, had, where did that fit into it? Okay, well, again, uh, on TV at the time, and don't forget mid-60s and early 70s, those films were only maybe about... 10, 15 years old. So these were coming on TV. So I was seeing, you know, Gort lift up his visor and zap tanks and everything with lots of theremin music going on. And that was so damn scary when you see that when, when you're 10 years old or so. I'm watching Forbidden Planet in black and white, which actually looks pretty good in black and white because it's black and white TV then. And so seeing several others like that too. And... In our school library, they had some uh, books on horror and sci-fi films. And uh, I also got a hold of some uh, Alan G. Frank's books. He did a good one of sci-fi films, and he did one from, I think, 2001 to uh, Star Wars. And I became interested in how do you make these types of films. But then in the mid-70s, you started getting things like uh, Starlog and Fantastic Films and um, a few other things. And then you would see the information on new films and TV shows and how they made those types of things. And also, because I was a modeler at that stage, uh, I was like trying to make spaceships from these films. And there wasn't that many around at the time. So do you think that a lot of your interest in the movies came from the hardware? Because as you said, you're, as a modeler, you had the interest in the spaceships and all the rest. Do you reckon that was actually... A real strong point in terms of getting hooked into these things? Well, well, that's an interesting point because I really started off more as a sci-fi lit fan because the um, sci-fi magazines were still fairly common then and there were a lot of paperback books around in our school library and all, uh, and the people I hung around with at school, we were science fiction fans there too and we would debate all the sort of way out science theories and stuff that they discussed in those magazines. And these were when science fiction was still fairly hard and took itself seriously. But also I was a science fiction art fan because I hadn't seen 2001 A Space Odyssey, but I really loved the spaceship from it. And I actually wanted to get a big poster of it. But at that time, I couldn't. 
And uh, that's actually what started me doing science fiction photography as well, because I thought, oh, well, look, I can't buy them. I'll see if I can take photographs of the model kits and uh, make a similar sort of thing myself. But certainly the hardware was a big thing. So how do you find, like, uh, from your point of view, being a, a film buff, as mm. it were, a uh, sci-fi film buff, mm. the um, evolution of sci-fi movies through from the 50s right through to the 70s and 80s, not so much today, um, because so much has changed, but to see how they were created in the 50s and how they looked and sounded mm. right through to what happened 30 years later. How did you find that ev evolution? Did you say, I'm oh, really adapting to all the new material that's coming out? Or are you thinking, no, I'm really, really dialed into what's occurred in the past, especially in the 50s? I think I appreciated them as products of their own period because you get some people say they're a fan of a contemporary sci-fi film and they can't watch... A black and white movie because they think oh it's too old-fashioned but I've always found I can adjust myself to appreciate something from a particular era like when they started um, showing the old space patrol shows from the 50s uh, I really enjoyed them because even though they were crudely done by modern techniques I could get my mindset into that sort of show so I also know that you have an interest in silent movies as well. I mean, there wasn't a lot of sci-fi silent movies made, but there were a couple. Obviously, mm. uh, A Trip to the Moon and Metropolis being the most obvious yes. ones. But there aren't a lot of people these days who have an interest in silent film, but I know you do. Mm. Uh, so is that a fair assessment? Oh, definitely, yes. Basically, film was being invented in front of our eyes, as it were, and just the way they were coming up with having to invent techniques to show things, and that that's... Because uh, my background is uh, as, as a scientist and I like to see things as experiments and these early filmmakers, in a sense, they were experimenters and they were coming up with new ways of doing things all the time. Like, oh, guess what? I've just invented the double exposure and that was done by accident. And um, there was a TV series called The Amazing Years of Cinema hosted by Douglas Fairbanks Jr. And that showed excerpts from early films as all sorts of genres but they had a couple of sci-fi and horror movie episodes which again I found fascinating and I was able to obtain a copy of those uh, some years later from a collector that was quite remarkable in the days before YouTube and um, downloading you simply couldn't get that and specialist DVDs you simply could not get that stuff so you mentioned that uh, you had an interest in the hardware from uh, sci-fi movies and that mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense because a yeah. lot of it was all uh, designed specifically for the films yes. which could be found anywhere. But I know you've also got a big interest in um, the visual effects side of things, which eventually led into your own productions. Mm -hmm. But um, the visual effects side of, of sci-fi movies, how did that sort of uh, tantalise your taste buds? And were you like one of those people who just were itching to learn how all this stuff was done? Yes, I was quite interested in that. And I'd read uh, various books. I think John Brosson, he, he who was a well-known... He was actually an Australian... Uh, film critic but he was based in England and he wrote a number of books on uh, science fiction films and also special effects techniques and he used to have a column in Starburst magazine so he'd be talking about things there and um, watching Doctor Who people were always criticizing the effects on that and I was watching thinking now how could you actually do that better even given the circumstances there so I started doing some of my own special effects based on what they were doing on Doctor Who, but seeing if I could do them properly or come up with ideas for it. And at that, that stage, I couldn't really uh, do it properly. But later on, I, I have, in my later filmmaking, I actually have duplicated those types of effects quite effectively. So from the Hollywood side, the the, the big filmmaking production side, yes. um, what would have appealed to you more, the way spaceships flew or the way monsters moved around which one do you reckon would have been the more intriguing for you i was always more of a spaceship type of person so i was uh, fascinated by as i say 2001 and then of course star wars coming out but i also always liked ray harryhausen movies and um i actually just watched one recently golden voyage of sinbad and i was just thinking that is this is actually like watching real magic just the way he, that's not one of his better known ones or the ones that people talk about all the time but just the the way he's done his technique in there it's really it's done so effectively it was it really was like watching a magician do something so with your um interest in the whole filmmaking um process did you yourself ever attempt to try and get into the industry as a professional modeler 
FX person or like go to film school, for example, any of those opportunities sort of present themselves or not? My problem was I I certainly wasn't from any like wealthy background. And in those days, you're working with film and you had to buy or rent cameras. And so I never really had much money to do that type of thing, apart from getting my own Super 8 camera and doing a bit of stop motion and that sort of thing there. If I'd had, I don't know, maybe you've had more um, now or opportunity, I might have had a chance there. You, you couldn't do that as easily as you could a few years later, e even sort of five, ten years later. Uh, I must say I was inspired, though, by people um, like the guys from Austrek who made the um, city on the edge of the Yarra. I mean, even seeing that, what, what is, you know, looks now a very crude Super 8 uh, jokey film but that was quite inspirational to me I thought what well, you can make a movie on your own film oh I want to do that uh, ironically I couldn't afford too much about that at the time but what I did do though I used to get the Cine Magic magazine which um, uh, Don Dollar in America um, published and um, was later taken over by Starlog and I used to read a lot of those I was just fascinated by the way the people in those were doing their special effects and so forth, which was also of interest to me because I could see how these guys were putting together spaceships and doing these effects. So I was doing uh, test reels of effects on Super 8 and, you know, ways to, uh, you know, m make spaceships move and that type of thing, you know, bits of animation, uh, cut out animation mainly. So, um, so in answer to your question, I didn't really consider doing it professionally, but um, I certainly was enjoying learning how to do it, at least on an amateur level at that time. But then you actually have sort of like started producing your own films of sorts, whether it be fan films or animation films or whichever else. But you're doing that for quite a while. So that has been going quite well. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, what I first started doing was for uh, fan clubs, the Doctor Who club in particular, I was putting together slideshows which they would show during some of their Christmas meetings and small conventions and so forth. And when uh, videotape became more freely available, I would start doing the same sorts of things but have the pictures just you know, shot onto tape with a video camera and then do a little bit of machine-to-machine uh, -machine editing. And I was still doing Super 8 work at the time. And then we started doing conventions and I would put together an opening video, which would be maybe a little bit of animation of a title and so forth. But then we'd do a video mashup where we would have TV shows. And I was fond of cutting them all together. So you would have um, Star Trek fighting Blake 7 and then the Daleks would appear and so on and so forth. And uh, then... I started uh, becoming involved with various film making groups and what would happen I'd come onto a project because they maybe needed some props being built or some special effects to be done and I again I didn't have much money to spend on these things but I started thinking of ways well what can I do to make my own films but uh, something affordable my first one was uh, live action which was seven victim but i um after that i felt um i'll try and get into some animated filmmaking because what happened there was a very popular star wars found film called broken allegiance and it was going to be a sequel called broken allegiance 2 but that fell through but before it fell through they thought oh well, let's see we'll try and do it we'll do it as an anime film but for various reasons that didn't occur. But I started thinking, well, with a limited animation film, the technology exists so one guy can do what it once took a whole studio to do. Like if we go back in the days of, say, Filmation and the Star Trek animated series, and I was thinking, well, what you can do, you can, uh, say, maybe go with a uh, comic book, but then you can animate the uh, lips on there much as they did in, say, Star Trek, uh, animated and uh, then you can move the um, spacecraft or vehicles in there and um, so that's when I started doing uh, animated films. I know you've made a fair few in your time so for the benefit of the audience can you just give us a rundown as to what you've created? So my first one was an adaption of a Ray Bradbury story called I Rocket so I quite enjoyed doing that. I thought it did a good effort on it. But the trouble was that didn't really attract that much of an audience, even though I thought it was a good product because it was an, based on an EC comic 
But then I thought, well, look, I'll try and find something which has a bit more audience appeal. So then I adapted one of the very early uh, Batman stories where it was just Batman by himself and he was up against a vampire. And that attracted far more viewers. So that went from there. So then I started animating uh, various other things which took my attention. So I, and I would actually get together people I know to do the uh, voiceovers and uh, do the music. And uh, then I actually made a version of uh, the comic Dan Dare because I had a radio serial which was also based on the uh, first comic story when I was able to get a hold of that from a reprint book and uh, that's actually been one of my most popular things so far if you look on YouTube it's got about 39,000 views then I did a few other projects based on Fireball XL5 and Stingray because uh, with the Fireball XL5 I got together a uh, cast to do the voices there and uh, then with the Stingray I had one of the um, uh, TV 21 records and also had the uh, comic strip to go with that too so I was able to match that up and do an adaption that way then uh, I was planning to do more like that but uh, what happened was some of the people I had as the voiceover people unfortunately they passed away so I had trouble getting people who could do that and then of course COVID hit so then it occurred to me well what do they do on SBS they show um, movies with subtitles so I started doing animated adaptions with subtitles and it occurred to me well why actually use a subtitle when you've got the original comic balloon so I um, started doing them that way and that's what I've been doing most recently and I've that's, this has been my most productive period for that. I've adapted uh, all the old Dalek TV 21 stories that way. I've adapted a few other Doctor Who stories from the old Doctor Who monthly and weekly magazines. And I'm currently working on Blake 7 and there's a few other little series I'm doing as well. So if anybody wants to check out um, the, the channel, it's on YouTube and it's easy to find. It's actually just called Russell Devlin. Uh, be sure to check under the videos section though because everything is buried under there and that really needs to be looked at. So there's a lot of good stuff there. You made a reference to the video um, tape creative stuff that you did back in the, the 80s and I remember uh, attending events where you had done opening ceremony videos and I had to give you a lot of credit. You were able to create things just with two VCRs, which is, you know, archaic technology by today's standards. Um, but even I would look at it and go, how did he do those effects? And to be fair, you come up with some very, very creative ideas because back then there were so few people who could actually do video clips of any description. Most people didn't even have two VCRs. But uh, even so, there's only a tiny handful of people who were that creative. And you were one of them. So... Uh, uh, you must be very pleased with how that all worked at the time because it was like people would have been scratching their heads going, this is fantastic. How did he do that? Mm. Yeah, well, one of the things was, as I said earlier, I was a science fiction modeler and that led me on to um, photography because I looked through my uh, various magazines like the Cine Magics and so forth, I looked how you could do um, reasonable space shots. And I, uh, in the days of film, I was able to do those... Uh, you know quite successfully and then I was able to do those um, using early video cameras then I experimented with other types of techniques as well but I'd work out how to do sort of spaceship effects and so forth and even develop my own back projection screen and use the Super 8 uh, camera for doing the back projection and so forth but I was able to do uh, model setups using that and then cut them into uh, other types of productions so so you're still doing the animated films and you're still doing the spaceship modelling. So mm -hmm. yes. that's all pretty groovy. So you you're kept yourself very busy from a creative aspect, which uh, I think is really good because there's a lot of people out there who have very little sort of like creative outlets mm. uh, and hobbies at all. Mm. And, and uh, you've always struck me as someone who's always had uh, uh, a lot of fingers and a lot of pies from a creative side, mm. whether it be the filmmaking side, the modelling side, um, or as we're going to touch on, the uh, the fandom uh, side as well. So, um, so regarding that, uh, so you got into the sci-fi local fandom community, I think it was in the late 70s, is that right? So when you started, uh, you joined Ostrick, the Star Trek Club. What happened was... Um when I joined RMIT, there was a uh, science fiction and comics club uh, there, run, actually run by Joe Italiano of uh, Alternate Worlds fame. And uh, 
He also mounted, actually it was called Comic Con of all things, uh, at RMIT. And uh, that was a small one-day con just held in there. But that was quite fascinating. And I actually even saw um, uh, early, it wasn't videos, it was actually a Super 8 film of uh, Flash Gordon and so forth there. And uh, so they also had some films on and they even had a small costume parade. And they also had a few rare collectibles and uh, comic books on display, which I'd only seen mentioned in magazines and that type of thing. And the uh, following year, I went along to uh, Trek on, which was the first um, Star Trek con uh, held in Melbourne and I've possibly even Australia, and that had as a special guest uh, Joe Holderman, the science fiction author who I was a big fan of. So uh, I got involved in the fan club there. I met a few people. I started going on to some of the uh, meetings, but also they, they used to have the Star Trek marathons as well. So in the days when Star Trek wasn't available on VHS or DVD or anything, and wasn't being screened regularly on TV, there was a cinema in town that uh, would screen these, you know, half a dozen episodes. So you go and watch them on the big screen. And admittedly, they were very shonky prints. There were bits missing. They were scratchy. Some had faded to the red. But just seeing Star Trek like that was pretty amazing. And what would happen... After everyone had seen the episodes a few times, they'd start hanging around the foyer of the uh, marathon and they'd, people would start talking. And that's an important thing in the early uh, fan clubs because videos weren't that accessible or non-accessible at all. Uh, people would sit around and just talk about the episodes and they'd start writing their own stories and they'd have social events. And this was at a time when, of course, no internet or anything like that, no Facebook. So that was the only way you could really catch up with fans at these meetings and at conventions and so forth. And people started forming friendships and some of those people I even know quite well today. So it was, a, it was like a big social thing. So you got involved in the convention scene. Uh, so this is uh, sci-fi conventions from the 1980s, which look vastly different to the conventions of today. But your strength wasn't just attending them, it was actually helping to organise them, being on the committee and running panels and discussions and all that sort of thing. So how did it work for you, sort of being up behind the table, being the presenter, and everybody sort of in the audience listening to everything you had to say? Uh, you got to share your knowledge of everything about sci-fi, which yes. would have been pretty groovy. Well, initially I was on board mainly to do things like the video program and so forth, but I, then I would say speak on particular shows. Originally I got very nervy because I was not like a public speaker type or anything, but what I found out later on... Once I started being able to crap on about something I knew, and especially with other people on the panel who knew about it as well, um, that was a lot of fun. And you could start talking through and you would get onto subjects. And also something I did, I would have my talk and I'd start um, having a little uh, video display of clips and so forth from a TV show or a movie. And... Uh, then I would comment on that and then the other people on the panel would comment on that and that was quite a good formula and, and uh, something which we used to great effect in the uh, Con 9 trilogy. It's very funny you're talking about that because I remember a convention specifically where you were doing a presentation with video and uh, halfway or a third of the way through the presentation the VCR chewed up the tape and you had an audience full of people and I remember that you took the tape out and of course all the tape has come away from the casing and while someone else filled in for you while you were uh, to keep the, uh, the talking going you actually performed effectively open heart surgery on a videotape unscrewing it which I didn't even know you could even do this taking the piece that had been chewed up cutting it out and splicing the two bits of good tape together reassembling the actual physical tape the case putting it back on the VCR and continuing on. I don't know if you remember that at all, but I was very impressed that you could actually even do that. <laughs> I can't quite remember which event it was now, but I do remember doing that. And I've got to say, with the uh, some of the video technology in the 80s, oh my God, that was really out of the arc. There was these video projectors we had, which gave a picture maybe about as good as, uh, well, you know, about the same size as the average modern screen people have in their houses. And that needed uh, sort of this like precision 2001 engineering to actually get it to work to show register and so forth. So do you uh, lament the loss of uh, conventions? I mean, you mentioned Con 9 uh, from outer space. And of course, you were instrumental in sort of like conceiving that. 
Uh, and then there was Con 70 and Con 80, which followed afterwards. So they were the last of the media sci-fi conventions held in Melbourne, at least, and possibly even in Australia as a whole. So do you lament the loss of conventions of that nature now because they're just no longer around? Uh, I think it's very sad that we don't have that because, I mean, okay, we've got the modern uh, events which attract uh, you know, numbers we could only have dreamed of back then, you know, 20,000 for a weekend or something, maybe even more. And with all, you know, big strings of uh, guests and things like that. And there's also the, there's the flip side where they have a convention where you've got maybe one or two guests from a TV show or a movie, but all it is, it's the guest and they get interviewed and then they charge you a uh, large amount of money for an autograph and it's people standing in line for a couple of hours to get their autograph but those sorts of events they don't have a lot of the things that we used to have like things like say the opening con video and the um, art show which, which was actually a very important thing back then and some people who were professional artists now that's how they started out they would just like do their own little uh, artworks or models or what have you and they'd show them to the local group and they developed their career from there so after all these decades of being a sci-fi fan working on films uh whether they be fan films or even sometimes professional movies which i know you've been involved with as well as all uh, the modeling and the um the, the the convention scene how do you see the future of the whole sci-fi fandom scene um and science fiction as a whole now that's become a far more openly accessible thing to the masses yes that's an interesting way of looking at things i i tend to think of um what I went through, that's all belonging to the past now. And you've got new things coming in. The, I mean, the popular culture type of cons and group fandom, the old fan clubs, most of them uh, have faded away or they're, um, you know, just like it's the, the older people tend to keep them going now. But uh, they're, they're not like what they used to be. So they, I think they belong to the past now. But the way you have it now, it's got small groups of people who connect through social media and then they get together for the big events and they come and they go, but there's new ones to take their place. So it's going to continue on for however long. But the old way of doing things, that, that really belongs to the past now, I think. But it's we've got some happy memories. And we did accomplish quite a bit, and we had a lot of fun doing it. So that's something. Speaking of having a lot of fun doing something and uh, things being in the past, one thing that has to be in the past is ourselves, because it's now time for us to sign off. So I've got to make a special thanks to my buddy Russell for coming in. It was nothing. So with a bit of luck, next week we'll have the Jaffra returning back with us once again, talking about his wonderful Disney trip as well as wearing his Mickey Mouse ears. So until that occurs, make sure you <gasps> stay nerdy. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da